Hello and welcome to the Roker Rub Hall podcast in association with the Sunderland Community Soup Kitchen. My name is Rich Spate and I'm joined for um, the second of a, I guess, a two-part podcast uh, series on the the TFT bid for Sunderland AFC. Uh, we spoke to Tom White earlier in the week, so we kind of know that the TFT bid for the 39% of Sunderland shares that are owned by Donald and Metvin is real, that it's been accepted, that According to Tom, it's with the EFL, and now the the, the conversation is between the EFL and um, TFT as a group. Scott Wilson in the Northern Echoes wrote on Thursday that because of the controversy with anything to do with crypto and the fact that KLD and Sartori owning sixty one percent together don't seem to want the 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 deal to go ahead, that it seems dead in the water. I think seems is the operative word there. And we can't be too careful when it comes to our clubs, especially uh, when the EFL are involved. So first and foremost, we really need to educate ourselves about who these people are. So who are the fans together? To tell us this story um, of the very new group of people that TFT are, um, I'm delighted to be able to speak with the authors of a fantastic new book, um, The Fit and Proper Persons. That's Martin Calladine and James Cave. Thank you for joining us. How are you both this evening, Martin? Terrific, thank you. It's great to be here, even if the subject itself is not necessarily one for celebration. No, but it is uh, one for fascination. Uh, it's certainly fascinating, if there's nothing else. And I know that you two are the, are the people who've really had your um, ears to the ground on this. And and James, how are you? I'm really good, really good to be here. Thank you very much for having us on. Appreciate it. No, it's, well, you're absolutely the right people to speak to because you've been tracking this group since its inception, since it kind of appeared on the internet back in December, was it? So can you tell our listeners the story? Because it really is it really is fascinating. So um, the Fans Together are a sporting group who want to take over a variety of sporting clubs in addition to uh, selling their own cryptocurrency. Um, that's the that's the very short version. In reality, when we've looked into TFT, we found that they're a very small organisation, for perhaps want of a better word, uh, primarily headed up by a uh, a guy called Simon Wentworth, who is a, a former football coach. He's from football schools. He's run a pub. He's he's played poker in his time, uh, and and came up with this really sort of grandiose idea that they were going to take over sporting clubs and in the selling of their crypto and, and in fan tokens, we're going to give supporters a say in how those clubs were run. They've made many lofty promises. We're dubious as to their ability to follow through on some of these incredible claims that they make. But essentially, when you add up everything they've said, their intention is to take over a billion pounds worth of clubs of various sports in various different countries. But the the, the, re- the reality doesn't look like that as as, as we've looked into the fans together and we've followed them pretty closely since you know they came to prominence their their initial claim was they were going to buy a premier league club and then they admitted mm-hmm. to us well that was maybe more for you know attention and a bit of publicity than than reality uh, obviously they they they've they've come back and forth they took over or they they took a, sh- a stake more accurately in a a greek regional second division club called uh, SC Episcopi uh, that they've been involved with for a couple of months and then out of nowhere uh, it, it came to light that they were in negotiations to take over a minority stake in Sunderland, which uh, which surprised pretty much everyone, uh, including ourselves. So you'd, you'd followed them pretty closely. That's, it's it's interesting that you say they've only been involved with Episcopal for a couple of months because it seems from the timeline that Tom set out to us that they must have very quickly turned their attention towards Sunderland AFC because this isn't something that's just come out of the blue. This is something that clearly they've been negotiating with the brokers who are holding or uh, marketing those shares for a few weeks and certainly been in touch with, with Tom for a good few weeks. So, Martin, who are these people? Because there's there's a there's a, a guy who goes by two different names, I think, who, who seems yes. to sit who seems to sit at the centre of this. So the, the impression you might get by the idea of this kind of radical crypto collective is that, you know, like the Wagme guys, this is some kind of big bearded Americans with loads of money behind them. It's essentially mm-hmm. a, a one man band with a group of kind of enthusiastic volunteers around him. Uh, the guy who's the founder and uh, who's kind of the main mover, the guy who was you know, doing the press conferences and, and signing the deal for, in Greece is a man called Simon Mycock, although he goes, as James said, by Simon Wentworth. 
Um, he's a, as James said, former football player, former football coach. But actually, what's really notable about him is that he's you know, in a long history of of running businesses, of which we reckon there's been at least nineteen. Most of those have gone into administration. Um, none seem to produce any particular profits. Uh, and he himself, as well as um, having been a seemingly a poker player for a while, uh, was made bankrupt in 2014 by a spread betting company. Um, mm-hmm. And you know, there's nothing illegal, of course, about going by different names. It's perfectly entitled to do that. There might be a number of reasons for that. But um, he, he's a guy we've spoken to on a number of occasions, and he's he's really charming. He's a really interesting, nice guy. But you know, I think we came away with the impression that he is a dreamer. Um, and that his belief in the power of, of crypto and crypto collectives to enable them to buy all of these clubs. You know, we're talking about clubs in, he wants to buy a top level club in, in Spain, in Italy, in France, Netherlands, Portugal, the UK, you know, a, a group that would that would dominate and rival City's um, group of clubs. So, I mean, it's it's the most wild ambition you can imagine at a time when crypto itself is in the toilet. And you've got basically this one guy making a lot of big promises whose business track record is is very, very unimpressive to say the least. Um, now we, we challenged him on this and he said, well, you know, we've got some venture capital behind us. And we repeatedly asked him to identify who those people were or how much money they're putting in. And, and we got nowhere with that at all. So the only evidence we've seen is that it is a small group of individuals who uh, have sold a few thousand pounds worth of, of hat gifts and have somehow come up with enough money to buy a minority stake in a very small club in Greece. Beyond that, you know, the, the gap between that and their ambition and the idea that they can somehow buy into Sunderland is, is a massive gap. And we don't know how they plan to fill that if they can. That's interesting and worrying. Um, the vehicle that they've chosen is this decentralised autonomous organisation, the DAO. It's a, a, an organisation that isn't an organisation, doesn't seem to have any legal basis in the UK. Can you tell me a little bit more about what DAOs are and how they're meant to function and whether it is even possible for them to own anything, let alone a, a share in, in Sunderland Football Club? Well, there's two views. One of one, their view is that DAOs are the future and are inevitable and will change the whole way that all businesses operate. In reality, what they are is a, a vehicle for selling cryptocurrency that operates largely as a collective, although it's not quite one member, one vote. You know, this is where the deception with the use of kind of fan ownership comes in. What they're saying is that anyone can buy in by buying tokens or, or, or coins, which will give them a certain amount of voting power. So you'd be talking about effectively a, a massive digital consortium and the, the 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 new bit really is that it's linked to a a kind of a Discord channel, which would allow people to exchange information and and vote on things. Um, and that's really it. it. It's a kind of a, a digitized form of, of voting and communication strapped onto cryptocurrency. Now, as you rightly said, um, it's not a a, a a recognized form of corporate entity in the UK. In fact, I think it's only Wyoming. It may be some other states in the US now that have rec- recognized them. So it's effectively like a digital limited liability partnership but those things don't exist here and when we pointed that out to him he said well we're, we're talking to people in jersey with our legal advisors with a view to resolving that and, and getting some recognition there but we don't know if that's happened so um you know they were popular a few years back when people used one as a fundraising device to buy or to try and buy a copy i think of the um declaration of independence and they raised like 40 million dollars and it wasn't enough to actually win the win the actual auction. So the money was returned. And off the back of that, everyone has said, this has transformed how we can raise money. And so you saw people recently saying, we'll use them to buy Chelsea. They got nowhere. Um, this week, we've just seen their attempt to try and buy uh, the Denver Broncos fail when the Walton Walmart family bought them for $4 billion. So actually, there's no real evidence that these devices have can raise enough money to buy a business a sports team and run it effectively. In fact, they're, they're so new that not only do they really ex- not exist, but there's no track record with them. So our thing again was when they bought them um, into the Greek team, we thought, well, at least maybe then they've scaled back their ambition. You know, their first pitch to us, we're going to buy a Premier League club. Their first purchase is 20% of a second tier Greek team. We thought, okay, they're going to learn from that. And maybe in a year or two's time when they've, they've figured out the nuts and bolts and it's got some legal recognition, then they come back with this plan. But, you know, three months later, six, literally six games of experience is what they have. They're, they're back to try and buy Sunderland. So they must have been kicking the tires in Sunderland, even as they were buying into the into the Greek team and probably to dozens of other football teams as well. So 
what are they? They're, at the moment, it's really an undefined kind of digital collection of people shouting at each other in a chat room. As we checked you know, earlier in the week, they had about 300 members. So you, know, you can do the, the maths yourself to see whether that it, it sounds like 300 people. And some of those, I say, were you know, Sunderland fans turned the fuck off. Whether that was enough people <laughs> to, to raise the, you know, the mooted fee of 11 or 12 million pounds, I, I doubt it. So, James, um, Martin's just expressed scepticism about <laughs> whether this is actually fan ownership. But if you look at their white paper, it has a fan charter at the, um, at, at, right at the start. And, and the first item on there is talking about fan ownership. It says this is all about fan ownership. And then it says about fan participation, fan engagement, about community being the, at the absolute core of this. Um, so is TFT a legitimate vehicle for football club fan ownership and and if not kind of why not no no it's not um <laughs> so <laughs> th- there's th- there's a big difference between what tft said in their white paper uh, which i i read again today um it was it was so much fun um <laughs> b- between between what what they promised in the white paper what's actually happening at episcopi and what they're they're talking about doing now there's there's a big difference bet- between all that so, so at, at, at Episcopi, uh, whereas Martin says they've, they've only been involved for a couple of months, um, and, and my Greek is a bit rusty, admittedly, um, but mm-hmm. having, having gone through today to see what's actually happening at Episcopi, none of that is happening. You know, the, the, there is no fan engagement. There's no fan offerings. I'm not. The, the, there isn't any mass outpourings of, of fan engagement or, or offers or meetings or anything like that. What is happening at Episcopi? Is that Simon Wentworth is, is is employing his mates and they're you know they're turning it into a, a profitable youth academy. That that is what's happening at Episcopi. So so none of the fan engagement or the fan token offering or, or any of that stuff applies at at um, at Episcopi. In in terms of Sunderland, that may be the plan, and I'm not necessarily suggesting it isn't. That they are so far away from that. That it's untrue, and and there's an argument whether it it is even true fan engagement. If you look down the white paper, and it's about it's a hundred pages long. This white paper, it, it's mm-hmm. a, it's a lengthy read. Um, when they they talk about the process of of down the line when they've taken over a controlling stake in the club and they and they're ready to offer these fan tokens and things like that, there is going to be a difference between free and paid votes. You know, so yeah. there will be votes that you will have to pay for. That now that that isn't fan engagement for a start. You you know, if if I can pay to have more votes than you, that isn't fan engagement. You know, if I have to pay at all, really, it isn't fan engagement. Um, it, you know, fan engagement can over Europe can take several several different models. You know, and in the in the UK, it's it's primarily supporters, trusts, and community ownership. Not perfect, but that is generally the way it's done, and it and it has, I'd argue, more strengths than weaknesses particularly lower down the pyramid. But that isn't what they're talking about here. And and you can actually look at elements of their white paper and they they, they, they lay out this roadmap of where they want to go and what they want to do. And and there are different phases and, and we're not currently at the stage where they're talking about taking over a controlling share in a club because those shares aren't on offer at Sunderland. They, they wouldn't be able to take the controlling stake in Sunderland. And they are, and if you actually look at the marketing section of their white paper, they do talk about acquiring stakes in clubs, possibly for the purposes of marketing. It, it is debatable, mm. given what Dreyfus said in his statement, you, you know, yesterday. Whether let's say they take out, let's say they buy these shares, there's no guarantee that Dreyfus allows them to do any of this at all. There's no guarantee that Dreyfus allows them to have any control at all in the running of the company. So the, the 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 fan engagement stuff is a, is a little bit of a red herring, and where they go in the future, that it's debatable whether it, it was true fan engagement and, and community ownership. And I would argue, my own personal opinion is that it wouldn't be. And can I just let's just stay on on that as well. You know, I've, yeah, yeah. They persistently misuse the term fan engagement. You know, I, as you can see, I, on, I retweeted this a few days ago. I had an argument with with, with Simon Mycock about this, where he said that they were fan ownership because once they owned the club. They would become fans of it, and that's the most ridiculous and circuitous logic. Because I said you know, <laughs> that abolishes the meaning of fan ownership. Every football club is, by definition, fan owned unless they're owned by someone who hates their own club. Um, you know, and, and of course, there is a special thing for fan ownership. They wouldn't be trying to claim that mantle if it didn't mean something, and it certainly doesn't mm. mean 
people who don't previously know the club coming in and buying it. We all know that's not what it is. And yet, curiously, that's what they're claiming. So all the way along, I think we've been concerned about the way they market themselves and the gap between their rhetoric and their actions. So one of the things that people keep uh, not being clear about, and probably that might be because it, it isn't clear, many of our local press um, are of the opinion that they, they, this group are looking to sell tokens in order to fund the purchase of the shares in Sunderland AFC, which are going to be at least um, £11.7 million, although from what Tom told us, it's probably been a, a different price negotiated for for us playing in the championship. Um, so it's on at least, you know, 12 million quid. Um, they paid €30,000 for their 20% stake in Episcopi. Um, and I can't find these shares for sale anywhere. So um, I don't know who wants to come in on this, but what what where's... Where's the money coming from? Are they going to try and sell tokens to us to get this deal through? Well, initially, that was definitely the plan, right? That was how it was, is that they would have rounds of fundraising through selling coins and tokens and NFTs, which would build this big war chest. They would go and start buying clubs, um, running those profitably, reinvesting the profits, selling more tokens, buying more clubs. That was the plan. Now, as you say, they've sold a few NFTs. They haven't got as far as an initial token offer yet. So... You know, the possibilities are either they got um, managed to agree a deal whereby they would have a period where they could raise that money through like an urgent sale of, of, of cryptocurrency. And, you know, you don't have to follow cryptocurrency too, too, in too much detail to know that the likelihood of raising 12 million quid um, in any short order by selling tokens is virtually zero right now. So if mm-hmm. they have genuinely got as far as demonstrating proof of funds, it can only be because it's not that money raised that way and it must have come from venture capital and then of course the question is well if we're presenting ourselves as fan ownership and and you know and, and simon mycock's fronting it and he's got his buddies in, in greece and whatever that's all one thing but if they you know if someone's putting 12 million quid that's who's running this who's that person mm-hmm. you know what do they want what are they involved in um you know i'm i'm my belief and i you know this is not necessarily what james believes but it's just my personal belief is that this is entirely tar kicking and that they don't have that money that they don't have it through venture capital because our experience with them didn't suggest the kind of people you would lend that much money to if i did i wouldn't lend it to them i would lend them a fiver um and they obviously haven't raised it um through crypto sales so i you know the 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 occam's razor says to me they don't have that money but i don't know james how do you see it yeah, they broad, broadly agree. Look, I, I listened to your, your interview with Tom, uh, and he's an excellent journalist. If Tom says it's gone to the EFL, then I, I've no reason to disbelieve him. You know, if Tom, then that's fine. I can accept that. But for it to have gone to the EFL, then then there must be proof of funds. If it's gone to the EFL, they must have have they must believe that they can reassure the EFL that they can have the funds if they're going to become if they're going to take a controlling stake in the club. You know, or or the the, the percentage thresholds. I'm, I'm I'm not fully sure. If again, Martin could t- could tell you more than I can. But if it's gone to the FL, they must believe that they they have the funds available. And as Martin says, whenever we've dealt with T, whenever we've we've dealt with them or looked at them or spoke to them or investigated them or we look at what's happening in Greece, there is no evidence, not a single shred of evidence that they themselves have access to anywhere near that sort of money. There's there's there's, there's no evidence of it at all. What what they did say to us when we had we had a meeting with with TFT very early on, well before you know they they taken over Episcopi or, or Sunderland came mm-hmm. into, into the picture, and we had a recorded meeting with them over Zoom, and they said to us that they had access to venture capital, and nothing else ever came of it, and it they've never disclosed to my knowledge, certainly in English, maybe they have in, in Greek, say my Greek's a bit rusty, but in English they've never divulged, divulged who is providing that, that VC if it exists. And if I was a Sunderland fan and, and this deal is anywhere near going ahead, I would be screaming from the rooftops wanting to know where the money is coming from because TFT have never demonstrated that they have it. Well, that's the thing that I think a lot of us at Roker Report can't get past really is these shares were with a, a reputable London share broker Donald and Methven, you know we we might not like them they're not daft you know Stuart Donald's a experienced businessman 
they've got lawyers, you know, they've been involved in dealing, uh, both buying a club and selling part of a club. They must know whether or not these people have got money and why would they accept a, a bid uh, from somebody who hasn't got, isn't able to show them a bank account with the requisite amount of money in it. That's, I think that you're right, the the thing we, we're going to have to keep pushing on as a fan base and it's why this, although it may appear to be dead in the water, just, you know, rationally, we are we are dealing with football finance and we're dealing with the, the EFL and that, and that does bring us to the kind of where we, we where we're at now. The deal being with the EFL, we know that a, a Dow can't own property in the UK. We've talked about possibly there being uh, some sort of um, front company or something brought in through Jersey. When I was reading about Dow's, there was the the um, the talk of Cayman Islands charitable trusts being a, a, a potential vehicle for them to put above them to be able to make investments and make purchases in the real economy in in other jurisdictions. What would you say is the is the chance of the of the EFL even having the r- right knowledge to ask the right questions about this? <laughs> Well, you know, there's no money in in overestimating the competence of the EFL, but you would assume they've been stung into action a little bit. I mean, what it's going to come down to is, is is there a company that is linked to them, it's UK based and has the money in its bank account? Because if that's okay, then the whole DAO thing is is irrelevant to one degree, because if you buy tokens or whatever in the DAO, the DAO has no legal standing and you don't have control of that company that will buy those shares. So the question is, does that company exist? And who are the actual named shareholders of that company? That's what you need to know. And does that company have or can it show proof of funds? We assume that must be the case, but we don't know. I still come back to, you know, you said, yeah, like, we, you, these guys are not daft. You know, but it, it really isn't that long ago that, that Manchester City signed up and launched a global cryptocurrency partnership with a company that doesn't even exist and is linked to a multi-billion pound fraud. So presumably more due diligence is done on this than in a, in a commercial takeover. But um, I'm not going to jump to the conclusion that there is something serious going on here. I would assume that the EFL will will weed these guys out. Yeah, I mean, we have seen this week that the purchase of Derby County got all the way to the EFL before falling down um, because of the lack of lack of proof of actual money being in the pot to 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 take over the club so uh, For the second time from the same guy as well yeah and that's the thing it, so maybe the thing is that deals can get to the AFL but whether they're going to get through or not is is another question i think one thing that a lot of fans and fan groups will be worried about is the competency and the ability of of the AFL to to even i think to even comprehend what has been on offer uh, in general, uh, and that big question hangs over it about where the money comes from. Um, the other, the other thing I wanted to to come back to you is on before we before we go, is this overriding kind of belief, understanding really that we have as fans that this group TFT is is actually essentially in the end looking to make money for themselves out of Sunderland fans if this goes through. James, is is that the case? Is that too simplistic, or is that ultimately really what is going to be driving any fan token crypto sale? It's over the long term. It's a really it's a really difficult question because to take over Donald and, and Meth and shares, no, they they are not looking to raise money from Sunderland supporters to do this initial deal let's call it an initial deal in case mm-hmm. they're looking to go further but to buy donald and Meffin shares no they're not looking to make money necessarily out of sunderland fans i i, I suspect they may hope that they log onto the website and, and maybe buy a few nfts but but that is that is not their main motivation in this initial deal what they have have spoke about and in, is in their white paper is that when they do take when they do take a control mistake, or even before then, they 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 are talking about an ICO, and I, I think they are getting ready for an, an initial coin offering where they do for the I think it's like ten billion coins. I think I read in the white paper that they that they're minting. You know that is the eventual plan, and if that does take off, 
which I, I, and I'm, I'll be I'll be blunt. I hope it doesn't. But if the, if if it takes off, that will be one of their main sources of cash. But the 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 confusing aspect about this deal about buying Donald and Methan shares is that that isn't what's happening. They're not they're not launching a product for Sunderland fans to buy to pay for this. Some seemingly TFT already have this money, and and no one no one is quite we're not sure where it comes from, and we've mm. we've looked into them more than most. You know, um, say so they 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 they. Are, they told us they had VC available. We, we've never had it confirmed. We've never seen it, but that is what they say. And it would make sense if this deal has gone to the EFL. If they ever manage to take a controlling share in Sunderland, which I think is unlikely, but let's pretend it, it happens, then yes, that that would be, I think, one of the main things. Um, but 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 it, it 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 it's a it's a bit of a red herring whether you know football fans. <laughs> It's a sort of unwritten contract. Football fans are happy to pay for things. They're not happy to be exploited. We're happy to pay for yeah. tickets. We're happy to pay for a hot dog. We're happy to pay for, you know, a TV deal or something like that. We're not happy to be exploited for for blatant profiteering, and and I I think what TFT are proposing is a is a pretty thin line. Well, I do, I can't disagree with you, um, on any of that having. You know, looked into this in a reasonable amount of detail, having kind of tracked crypto and the and the um, and the football industry and the relationship. There aren't too many examples out there of even the lightest touch, non kind of uh, share linked uh, tokens having uh, much success. And also, you know, there's the 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 the, the legal case against the Arsenal socios that were showed that. Um, they were actually essentially financial products that weren't being marketed properly. So, um, again, I'd just like to thank you for you, both your time and expertise and give you the opportunity, really, if there's anything that we haven't talked about in the last few minutes, just to, to kind of, if there's something that you want to communicate to, to Sunderland fans about TFT or about this deal that, that you think... Uh, that we need to know, Martin. Is there anything, or have we got have we got through the only, the... the only the only little things I would just add is is to to underscore that the business track record of these people is very poor, in my view, and the plan has always been big, multiple clubs, which mm. means that you know just as they try to roll Episcopy into this purchase, Sunderland uh, or a minority stake in that would be part of then an attempt to then roll up into bigger thing elsewhere. They're not happy with just owning a part of your massive, historically significant club. They want to form a global group financed by billions of pounds worth of cryptocurrency sales. You'd be only a, if it ever happened, you'd be only a, a kind of a, a small part, a small cog in that bigger wheel, or, albeit perhaps a entirely fantasy wheel. Yeah, and James? <laughs> Mine is the brains of the outfit, so you hear, you see, and, and, and sort of sums it up nicely than I can. So, but but to, to, to digress, uh, let me direct, direct. I know we spoke a little bit about TFT a couple of days ago because I came across something today that is just too good not to share. Okay, um, go on. So I was I was looking into um, what was going on at FC Episcopi, uh, and it and it's 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 hard because again I I don't speak Greek and everything I read I've got to try and translate and then you're reading a dodgy translation and it, and it's difficult to try and get to grips with what's actually happening there. But then I noticed that uh, Episcopi had recently appointed a new manager in early May, um, and, and it was a name that was familiar to Martin and I. Probably won't be familiar necessarily to to anyone at Sunderland. He was a he's a chap called Daryl Willard, and uh, Daryl Willard gave a little press conference. You know, and uh, you know, said that he wanted to play exciting football, score goals, and win games. Really revolutionary stuff. Uh, but what he didn't say was that um, he'd previously worked with Simon Wentworth on a company that's currently in receivership and had previously been bankrupt himself. So when he said, you know, why why have you come to Episcopi? He said, oh, because it's because it's great. You know, because they've got a really exciting project. He didn't say actually because I've known the bloke who's taken over the club for the last ten years, and it just sort of speaks, I think, a little bit to the sort of people that we're dealing with. I'm not, you know, alleging anything nefarious, but it, I, just, I thought it was a really sort of telling sign. Yeah, I, that is that is a connection that I stumbled across today as well. We're probably on the same websites at the same 
at the same time. So thank you both for your insights because I, I think it's absolutely fascinating. The research that you have done for the book, the book, um, the book is called Fit, Fit and Proper Persons. It's looking at um, owner owner FC. Is that um, owners FC? Uh, a case study of that, but I think goes into a lot more detail about the whole area of football club ownership and is well worth um, you going on Amazon and, and buying a copy of. Um, lots more coming up on Rook Report. Clearly, we're probably going to have to get together as a group and talk about this as a group of editors, probably, um, and look at the implications. Uh, loads on the website, but just finally say thank you very much, Martin. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. And thanks a lot, James. Really enjoyed it. Really, really enjoyed it. Have a good day. Cheers. That, and thanks to everyone for listening. And uh, yeah, let's just keep trying to find out as much as we can about these, these dodgy fellas. It's a wrap.